Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister of this congregation, along with members and friends, children and youth of all ages and at all stages of life. We recognize our deep connections as we live out our mission and ministry. And one of those ways we recognize our connections is through uh, our deep connections with the past, present, and future. These lands are the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they were in the past and for who they are as a people today. You might have noticed that we have another change of schedule. Uh, we are online again for this Sunday morning. Um, the music Sunday uh, that was intended to be on the plan for today will now be May 29th. The salad luncheon that was also supposed to be after service today will also be after service on May 29th. I hope you'll join us in whatever ways we can gather. The choir wants to share their music and the caring team hopes to raise funds for um, people in need. Uh, the funds raised will benefit, will go to the minister's discretionary fund. I want to add a note that our TLC task force is reviewing area COVID information. Unfortunately, it's on the rise. Please see updates by email <laughs> or contact the office if you have questions. COVID numbers have risen significantly in recent weeks. We ask that you get checked out and tested for COVID. Right now, a lot of times those symptoms are looking like colds, flus, and allergies. We want to make sure that everybody takes good care, and is informed about their health as well as possible. I also want to invite you that while we're online again, that this is a chance to make a donation to the congregation through our online system, our website, or texting. See the link in the chat uh, for a chance to be giving to the church. And thank you very much for your ongoing support. We continue to be making great progress in our annual campaign and if you haven't had a chance to pledge yet, now is a great time. Again, contact the office for pledging information. We would love to hear from you. Now I want to invite uh, Carol Manny forward to make an announcement on behalf of Joyce Rosenberger. Good morning. And I hope you're all sitting in a nice place at home or out in the yard maybe out in a park with your laptop. We're glad to have you all here. Volunteers are beautiful. Our church community is very fortunate to have so many volunteers. The beauty created in our church by volunteers is amazing. So much of what makes our church a wonderful place is created through the work of the many volunteers. And we really want to recognize them. Now's the time to submit nominations for the Volunteer Awards. Volunteer Recognition Awards are Church Mouse, which is awarded to members or friends who work tirelessly behind the scenes, quietly contributing to the well-being of the church. Above and beyond is to acknowledge members or friends who lead, whose leadership for a one-time or ongoing volunteer service goes beyond the regular service expectations of the church. The Outstanding Service Award is given in memory of Jack Vaught to honor his unselfish, long-standing gifts of time and talent. Nominees for the Outstanding Service Award must be a church member and uh, with a history of volunteerism on behalf of the church and, and for at least five years. Other factors to be considered for nominees for this award are the nominee's ability to facilitate volunteer service of others. The nominee's, nominee's volunteer services in the larger community and the nominee's adherence to the UU principles in daily living. Nominations are due no later than May 31st. Uh, forms for these nominations are attached to your letter, church newsletters, 
uh, there on the connections table in here. But you can also email Joyce Rosenberger, and that's jmrosenberger46 at gmail.com. You can give Joyce the name of the nominee, the award you're recommending, and the reason that the person should receive that award. Thank you. And now we hear about our art show and auction from Amanda Franklin. Hi, hi. My name, my name is Amanda, Amanda Franklin, Franklin, and I wanted, and I wanted to, share to share a few details, details about the upcoming, upcoming art, art show and fundraiser, The Beauty of Us. Of us. The, event the event will be held at the church, church on Saturday, Saturday May 21st, from 1 to 4, 4 p.m. p.m. For compliance, for compliance with the recent COVID-related COVID restrictions, we will have windows open for ventilation and ask that all attendees mask when inside and be mindful of social distancing. Now for the fun part, the beauty of us. There is beauty in each and every one of us, and we have so many opportunities for you to share your beauty. There's beauty in volunteering. Check the Friday News or, the, or Facebook for a link to sign up to volunteer. You can also help with setup on Friday, May 20th. You could volunteer to help with the bake sale, with creating art at the event, or even help others place their bids. There's beauty in giving. Donate to our auction or bake sale. Auction items could be art that you've created or that you've acquired. Overnight stays in your Airbnb or out of town condo. Spaces in a class that you lead, or even a variety of different gift baskets. There is beauty in lending your possessions. Specifically, we are asking to borrow your easels that you might have at home, whether they be floor, standing, or tabletop. You could drop them off anytime this coming week at the church, and just be sure to attach your name so that we can get them back to you after the event. There's beauty in learning. I'm sure that most of you have heard by now that all of the uh, auction bidding will take place online using your computer, smartphone, or tablet. I know this might sound daunting or maybe scary, but think about all the new technology that you have learned in the last two years. I have every confidence that you will be able to place bids without problem. Galabid, it's the platform that we're using, is so user-friendly and easy to learn. Soon, we'll be sharing simple instructions to register and view the great items that we have received for donation or on commission. If you are at almost any level of tech savvy, I'm asking you to volunteer to help others and become one of our gala buddies. We will provide you training and all you need to provide is a phone or tablet, a smartphone or tablet. There is beauty in community. I hope that you will find your own way to be a part of this new and exciting event for our church. Donate, bake, volunteer, bid early, bid often. Come on Saturday, May 21st, and join us in this new event. You are the beauty in us, and I hope that you'll share that beauty. Thanks, Thanks and have, and have a great, a great day. day. I want to thank Amanda and everybody who's making this art show and auction possible. And I want to invite you to participate in any of the ways, or maybe so many of the ways, that Amanda just told us about. Please join us for this art show and auction on May 21st from 1 to 4 p.m., and the bidding will also extend after that. Come and check it all out. They'll, you'll be seeing some images of the art that's already been collected a little bit later on in the service. And now, let us turn to our opening hymn, Gathered Here.
our opening words. This morning's call to worship inspired by words from the late John O'Donohue. Let us lean towards the transforming presence of beauty. Let us linger as much as we need, and perhaps a moment longer, though not much more than that. Just as we are built for atrophy, so too we are built for generative beauty, a beauty that beckons us towards an unfolding growth, towards a possibility of deepest connection with great mystery that the universe and that of each other. Our chalice lighting is from the Reverend Scott Taylor. As we celebrate life's beauty, may we never forget that we are part of it. It is woven around us, through us, between us. We are here to notice those elegant strands, the way they call to us, the way they hold us, the way they connect us. May our time together enable that beauty to shine. With the lighting of this chalice, we begin again to let that beauty shine. Now we offer our interlude, Open My Heart. Good morning. Today, as we explore the power of the beauty around us, let me share a story about finding beauty where we least expect it. It is called, Who Loves the Dark? Adapted from Sherry Philibon. There was once a child who got lost in the woods. As night began to descend, the child became more and more frightened. He had always been afraid of the dark. He was more afraid of the dark than any of his friends or his siblings. He didn't know why he was more afraid than his friends and siblings. He only knew that when the sun went down, he was very glad to be inside his brightly lit house. When the sun was all the way down, the child got so frightened, all he could do was sit down and cry. Soon, he heard a voice say, what's all that noise? Before he could scream, there was a flutter of wings and the creature flew down near him and he could see that it was an owl who said, no need to cry, don't be scared. If you just give me your address, I can guide you home. With that, the child did indeed stop crying, partly out of relief that someone might be able to lead him home and partly out of curiosity as to how an owl could locate his home with or without the address. But Deciding he had little to lose, the child choked back his tears and replied that he would be very grateful to be guided home and gave the owl his address. So, this strange pair headed off through the dark forest in what the child hoped was truly the direction of his home. When his fear had left him just a little, the child looked around and he began noticing his surroundings a bit. At one point, 
he noticed a flower he'd never seen before and slowed his pace so he could gaze on it. That, said the owl as they continued walking, was an evening primrose. Did you know that there are flowers that bloom only at night? There are moon flowers and night gladiolas too, flowers you would never see if you never went out at night. After a while, the owl said, as if musing to himself, and of course there are animals too who love night and the darkness. Me, for example, I love the dark. In the daytime, the light hurts my eyes, so that's when I like to go into my tree and sleep. To this, the boy replied, Well, I like the daytime. I can see to kick a ball, and I like the hot sun at the beach. When the dark isn't scary, it's just boring. Boring, you say, replied the owl. And he clearly had some opinions to express at this point. But just then, there was a fluttering and squeaking above their heads. It took the child just a few seconds to figure out what it was. And he shrieked, a bat, and started flailing his arms and knocked the creature away, shrieking the whole time. The shape backed away and said, excuse me, that's just my way of saying hello. But you're a bat, said the child. A creature of darkness, weren't you trying to drink our blood? No, said the bat, but I have been eating lots of yummy insects who would have been biting you if I hadn't been around. Anyway, I couldn't help overhearing what you said about darkness being boring. If you want to come just a little bit out of your way, I can show you something really exciting. They followed the bat down the path and traveled through the deepest forest for just a few minutes and then came out onto a dark beach. The child gazed out at the beach, lit very gently by moonlight, and thought, this is certainly beautiful, even in the dark, but I wouldn't call it exciting. Just then, there was movement in the sand, like a little bubble of sand rising up. Then there was another little bubble, and then another, and then it looked almost as if the beach were boiling. Then, out of one of those little bubbles of sand, popped a round shape. As they watched, more and more shadowy shapes came up out of the sand, and soon the child realized what he was seeing. Lots of baby turtles, hundreds, climbing out of the sand. This was truly exciting. Once each turtle shape pulled itself up from the sand, it started crawling as fast as its little legs could carry it toward the water. When baby sea turtles hatch, said the owl in a sort of teacherly voice, they need to find their way to the water. And they almost always do this at nighttime because to find the water, they need darkness everywhere else to follow the moon and starlight reflecting off the water. Daytime sunlight is too bright and scattered everywhere. As they turned to leave and head back toward the child's home, Al spoke again, as if thinking aloud to himself, you know who else loves the darkness? The moon and the stars love the darkness. That's when they can really shine. Oh, they're there in the daytime as well, hidden behind a wall of light. But when that wall goes down with the sun, the stars and moon reveal their beauty. The child and the owl left the forest and walked down a street that the child recognized as his own. He was very happy and relieved, but also a little sad to say goodbye to Owl, to whom he gave a very gentle hug and a thank you. He went into his home and, being extremely tired, got ready for bed right away. Before he went to bed, as a matter of habit, he went and bent down to turn on the night light that he always kept glowing at the night to keep the dark at bay. But before his fingers touched the switch of the night light, he smiled and pulled his hand away. He got into his bed pulled up the covers, and let the comforting arms of the darkness soothe him to sleep. It was beautiful. May we all keep ourselves open 
to wonder and beauty, whenever and wherever it lives. So be it. I invite us into a moment of reflection. In this moment, I will offer the lighting of our shared candles. In doing so, I extend the care and community to all who are with us in worship today or worship at another time. This is the time, if you have them, to light your own candles, whatever form they may take, to bring light in your, into your heart as you are able. We will enter into this candle lighting while sharing their music for meditation. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit drawn near. This is the time in our community for the sharing of joys and sorrows. I want to offer uh, first a note of joy and a formal welcome. We now have a new person in uh, the office in the role of office assistant. I want to welcome David Hank to our office staff. He began on May 2nd, um, and we're so happy that he decided to join us. Please, when you have a chance, please extend a welcome to David. Now I need to turn to sorrow, especially a sorrow in our larger world. We extend our sympathy and our outrage to the community of Buffalo, New York. Yesterday, Saturday, May 14th, a white male gunman shot and killed 10 people. Three people were injured. It was a deliberate and extensively planned effort to kill people who are black. 10 of the people who died, or 10 of the people who were shot were black. I want to offer a prayer from my colleague, the Reverend Julia Hamilton. A spirit of life and lamentation. Once again, the news of violence comes like a hot knife through our hearts as we learn of a gunman who opened fire in a supermarket in Buffalo yesterday, targeting black bodies, black lives, reminding us that hate and fear are festering in our nation and that guns are shortcuts to sorrow. We hold in our hearts the 10 lives lost, the injured, the grieving families, the shattered community. And we hold in our bellies the fire of conviction that pours forth from our prayers in pulpits across the nation, no more. 
no more. Dear God, no more. We pray and we act and we organize and we console and we protest and we grieve because it is what we must do again and again and again until justice rolls down like water and washes away the salt on a mother's cheeks, until justice comes like healing rain that fills dry riverbeds, until justice floods the civic plain, until then we water the earth with our tears. Let us hold the people of Buffalo in our hearts. Let us share one more moment in quiet together. So much is with us, within us, in the swirl of the world around us. Let this moment be one moment of grace where we are held and included in our circle of care. Join me in one more moment of quiet. Amen. We turn to a prayer of song in peace with Dona Nobis Pachem. Dona Nobis Pachem Pachem. reading today is from the Reverend Teresa Nimas Soto, and it is wonderful. Listen to it. I like it. It makes me laugh. Whenever people say that E.E. E. Cummings abandoned traditional forms because they say it with such confidence. I have inherited an internet, but also a real friend who lost her teeth when she was pregnant, and she was young, at least tooth age, and the other day, I had a fight with a stranger on the internet, kind of like a keto, because I kept saying, I understand, that's how you feel. I feel a different way. I actually think that it is literally possible to find someone attractive, beautiful even, without their tooth bones, out and showing because kindness makes your eyes shine like our chummy sun and confidence allows you to establish your own path of orbit, neither fragile or uncertain. They gave up and huffed a last word. What about the scientific definition of beauty? which is something like the literature's definition of dancing, the Pantone colors of the galaxy, or even the electromagnetic signature of a poem, the magnetic resonant imaging of the muscle of a word as it flexes and tears away from the bonds of traditional form 
they could not know. Higher than the soul can hope or mind can hide is pretty high. And this is the hubris of supposing that tradition is too brittle, moth wings flaking to be moved. Someone, I beg your pardon, professor, natters, whinges on what he abandoned forms when he was teaching us to fly. This service is an opportunity to explore our theme of nurturing beauty for today, for this month. And I so appreciate this opportunity that came about from a, a change in the worship schedule. To me, I want to, it's a chance to think about that beauty is an exercise in experience experimenting, creating, making a mess, and trying again. It is an entire spiritual practice all by itself to think about how to bring something more wonderful, vibrant, luscious, meaningful, powerful, truthful into the world. And I want to thank the congregation for accepting my invitation for uh, your stories, your photos. What do you think? How has beauty transformed your life? How does it make you? Uh, first off, I want to recognize uh, Joe Lakota for bringing uh, kind of the key, one of the key images here, um, that of the the fair warning for when you share something with the minister, with permission, of course that anything you say or do can be used in the sermon. This is an intentional invitation. You see the picture of the mug with those words on it. Um, but I appreciate that Joe started us off with beauty, truth, and humor in this moment. So many of you started with nature as a powerful common theme when thinking about how beauty has transformed your life, how it uh, impacts your every day. The image I started with uh, for myself was one I had taken uh, on Grandview Drive here in Peoria. It was an image of sunrise uh, looking over after I had dropped off a child at school. Just to be able to have a peaceful moment and look out as the wonder of the world began. The dawning of everything in that moment. Levina Farden offered an image of beauty herself talking about how she turned to nature all the time, often Sedona in the Southwest, but in this case, she shared this wonderful image from Tawny Oaks from Autumn and the trees turning in all of their brilliant and beautiful colors. Part of the, uh, part of the practice that we engage with is largely 
often largely as individuals in this exploration of beauty. It's a, such an internal and external conversation and engaging with the world. One of the examples I thought of in this moment was a recent piece of art from one of my children. Uh, it's a Zentangle piece created at school. And I thought we'd appreciate that one because it was created. And I think there's an image deep inside of it, uh, amid swirls and colors and patterns, an image deep inside of a fox, if you will, amidst all the tentacles and tangles that are around it. It's also is a nod to a class offered just recently by Joyce Rosenberger, the Zentangle class as well. Carol Manny uh, talks about beauty in this case and offers an image of paint tubes uh, for, for the exploration. And she talks about how I love color, spring flowers, beautiful bright vegetables, plants all lined up ready and fabrics and lights and gems. I can remember coming down an escalator at a Paris department store and all of a sudden my daughter and I saw thousands of Christmas ornaments all lined up by color. We rode that escalator four or five times until we got off the floor amongst the hundreds of bo colored balls of glass. How, how do you pick a color, a color of green? without first considering, is it mint or sage or the color of pine needles? The possibilities are endless when you experience color. What will make you most comfortable in your living room? What, will, what azalea will make the front door seem inviting? What vegetables go right in the salad to make it most appetizing? These details and layers and that joy of playing with the possibilities. That is part of how beauty makes us. I know Kelly Landon is one among many people who talked about finding, reconnecting with art during the pandemic as well. She talks about that she had kind of given up on thinking of herself as an artist or somebody who could offer that into the world. But during the pandemic, she dove back into art and found it a source of personal joy, as well as now that she's also leading classes in creating. She's leading classes in creating, helping people find what beauty and uh, creativity mean to them, and thus is making it both in them and in the community as well. Dave Grebner talks about uh, his own experience of nature as well as music. He says, for him, beauty of nature has transformed my life. He said, years ago, I went back to college. I got my master's degree in environmental studies. Being out in nature helps me realize that I am part of the web of life, that I come from Mother Earth and someday will return to her. And the other beauty in my life, he says, is music. That from the symphonic works of Aaron Copland, such as Appalachian Spring, to the compositions of Jean Sibelius in Finlandia and Karelia, to jazz and bluegrass and rock, music helps me feel the beautiful vibrations of life. And for this, he says, I thank my mother, Bernice, who composed her own light classical music. So Dave kind of comes, brings in a lot of different forms for us as we're thinking about what is the transformative power of this in nature, in art, in music, and much more. But I know so many of us, whether or not we create um, art of our own, that we go out and seek to see beauty and creativity in the world. One of the places, uh, certainly this is something that's been cultivated in my family and we're cultivating it in our children as well. The image I wanted to turn to for this moment was one that I had taken some years ago uh, at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. We took our then uh, much younger and much smaller son, this is from 2014, to the art exhibit of samurai uh, uh, armor and 
weapons and those being cherished as their own art itself. And the power and the discipline and the culture that all went into creating those and why they were present and valued at the time that they were. In this case, the picture you see is one where one of the notable, most notable examples of the armor is red and black in different shades and textures finely woven, very tough, with a grotesque, uh, exaggerated features dark mask to kind of create this sense of power and intimidation. And in the image, it has blown up many more times the size of the actual armor. But in this image, the photo that I took, at the very base of it, you see this little figure of about five years old wearing a green striped shirt of my son when he was younger, kind of taking the same pose as that armor and seeing himself in that power, in that possibility. This is all part of how we connect and nurture this connection to the transforming power of beauty in ourselves, but in the people around us and help them understand the value as such. What I also know, what also came out from members offering different thoughts for today was how much we see the transforming power of beauty in each of us, in this congregation, for example. I want to thank uh, Georgia for bringing some of the photos to mind, sharing them on our Facebook group. One of them is from sitting in the sanctuary and a selfie taken with two other members of the congregation. And just seeing the joy and lightness and brightness of people together in the pews, sharing the moment, that also, that also is part of that beauty that makes us, that we see each other, that we are with each other, that we would gather in together and take such joy from that. Part of that is also learning from each other. I want to turn to uh, George Evans' photo of the late beloved Shika Bhattacharya. Uh, she was someone who really embraced the transforming power of the world and, and the beauty of what each of us could teach and offer to each other. And here in, in this photo, she's talking about her teachings from the lessons from her beloved Hindu traditions and how much she wanted to bring that out into the world as well. And beyond our individual kind of relationship with each other, we do creating beauty together in ritual, in the regular gatherings of our lives. I enjoyed being part of the past winter solstice service created and, and managed by Amy Pop and by another and various members and friends of the congregation. Um, so you'll see the table that was created and offered at the middle of this winter solstice circle that had pieces of paper on us for us to write uh, our intentions uh, for the coming year that they were later brought out into the fire and burned. That we recognize by ritual how the cycles of dark and light, the cycles of the moon and the sun also have their impact on us and our meanings in life and our understandings of our time and sense and history and purpose. And of course, I couldn't be talking about such things as ritual without mentioning Christmas Eve. I want to thank Georgia for this beautiful Christmas Eve photo. In that, I think in our Christmas Eve service is one of those concentrated examples of the beauty of music, the power of story, how we are gathered in deep celebration of the beginnings of a child's life, a child that is set on a radical message of love that is aspiring to transform and heal the world. And we do so with candles and wreaths and music for all of us, friends and neighbors, those familiar and those who are strangers, all being welcomed into such a moment. We turn to thinking about kind of 
reflections on what does beauty mean to us individually and our purposes for it. I so appreciate Ray Keithley talking about one of my main goals in life is to create beauty, whether it's as an artist or just in the conduct of our daily lives. I also try to appreciate the beauty of whatever I may encounter. So how we conduct ourselves is part of that effort or what we encounter, being able to witness to the world. I found one that was a little bit deeper than expected. I want to thank Terry Matthews for this image of the book cover that we have uh, from Larry Matthews' daughter, her thesis on the German Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant. Uh, Patricia M. Matthews, uh, someone who was part of this congregation's religious education program, her PhD thesis is The Significance of Beauty, Kant on Feeling and the System of the Mind. I will say I had to resist taking a deep dive uh, into Kant and beauty and what on what this could possibly be unfolding and implying for uh, our understanding of it. If this is an opportunity, I invite you to go take a go take some diving into this understanding of beauty just by itself. But I need to offer also that there was a contrast in one of the conversations from Lindy Peterson gave the example of not necessarily connecting with an ideal image of beauty or beauty as something that would be valuable um, because beauty seemed to be about right and wrong or highly subjective um, so that how could one kind of capture it and connect with it and what use would it be if it was so entirely uh, an either-or proposition uh, based on somebody's opinions. But in growing, she talked about encountering a more expansive idea of beauty and found that there were things that could be described as intrinsically beautiful. Uh, one could be uh, the experience of playing defense in softball where we were so well practiced that in every situation, every person on the field reacted instantly and exactly in the correct way. Everyone knew what everyone was supposed to do and everyone trusted that everyone would do it. So here's another understanding of what can be, what can be transforming about an understanding of beauty, where if there's flow, where if there's a sense of connection, what, how that can show up in any form including on the softball diamond. That story or song can be beautiful, she was saying, because it tells a truth or inspires us to believe. And so too can be transformative love and how it can improve people's lives. But being lightly attached to a sense of beauty and being willing to explore the question, the nature of beauty itself, can allow us to be more open to what is weird or ugly and not necessarily obviously pleasing, if you will. I think an element of beauty that we need to bring out in this moment is one that's full of heartbreak and challenge as well as, as, well as being filled up. Joyce Rosenberger talks about how the beauty of the planet Earth never ceases to amaze me and inspire me, and that the harm that people are doing to this home of ours saddens me. I'm not sure when I became aware of the beauty of our world, but I have a memory of sitting up in the mountains in Banff and in in Canada with this feeling of absolute peacefulness and joy. And yet here is how we also treat our earth in such terrible ways. I think Judith Corn Shanahan brings out those different connections in the complicated nature of our lives. She said, we all need beauty in our lives to help survive the worst parts, the daily sorrow of pictures of war when we are helpless to stop it, the sudden and unexpected deaths of loved ones 
the destructive storms that strike when we least expect them. We need to be reminded through music, whether classical or contemporary, through dance and art and, and blooming trees and bushes and licks from our beloved dogs and cats too. We need a warm hug and smiles from friends and from family. The beauty of children we may have born, seeing them in the hope of the future in their wide eyes. We need, she says, we need to create art to learn we are creative souls in so many ways. Not all of us create in identical ways, but in so many ways. The dance and play an instrument and write poetry and make finger paintings, make all the beauty, make all the beauty we so desperately need and crave. Being able to engage with such practices of beauty, it really makes us more able to see all the world in its entirety, to survive, and to wonder and imagine something different, but not shy away from what is painful, and what has been our legacy, and what is our current struggle. We cultivate an encounter with the world in exploring the nature of beauty, with history and humanity and the freedom to express as well as live and thrive. We witness moments when we're more open to the experience of beauty. We witness moments that stop time and space. There's a notable photo from 2016. It's entitled, Taking a Stand in Baton Rouge. I'm not sharing it today because I don't have permission, but I invite you to check it out. Let me talk to you about it. From 2016, there are protests against police violence in predominantly black neighborhoods and populations. There was a protest against the deaths, uh, the terrible deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, black men, black young men at the hands of the police. The photo taking a stand in Baton Rouge became notable and famous. In it is the central figure of a tall, slender, dark-skinned African-American woman. She's wearing a lightweight sundress with black and white patterns cascading down it. You can see the flow of the lightweight dress blowing in the breeze. She is standing in the middle of the road, calm, poised with her hands folded in front of her as she holds her cell phone. And she is simply there, present, not moving. The other half of the photo you'll see in her immediately in front of her are three uh, police officers clad in black armor. They look like these sleek black beetles all in their gear, and they have been moving towards her at speed. You can see that they're running to stop themselves before they hit her, before they come into contact with her. And behind them is another further line of officers in black armor. In this particular photo, we don't know what happens next. All we see is this woman entirely bare and unarmed being encountered by these heavily armored officers. But the history of police violence and our culturally learned violence against black bodies makes this a tense and terrible moment, leaving most of us fearful for her well-being. What will happen when they touch her? Now, this woman was, in fact, peacefully protesting. The, the officers were trying to clear the highway that had been blocked by protesters. And so she knew that she was going to be arrested, and she still stood there, ready. This woman was Aisha Evans. She was captured in this photograph. She had transferred, uh, traveled to Louisiana with the Young Minds Can, a civil rights organization, along with other concerned citizens. 
And here's what she said about that moment. When the police pushed everyone off the street, I felt like they were pushing us to the side to silence our voices and diminish our presence. They were once again leveraging their strength to leave us powerless. As Africans in America, we are tired of protesting that our lives matter. It's time to stop begging for justice and take a stance for our people. It's time for us to be fearless and to take our power back. All of that was held in that moment, in that one photo of that young woman facing all those heavily armed officers. So let me offer what happened after. It was immediately followed is that those officers did in fact arrive at her, take her arms and lead her directly to jail. She was physically uninjured in the encounter. But there she was in her form, a queen crowned with poise and presence instead of gold. It reminded me of art by Kenheidi, Kenheidi Wiley, who's a contemporary black male artist known for his portrait of President Obama, who was seated and surrounded by greenery with some peaks of other colors. Wiley's work is a photorealistic style against densely patterned backgrounds. And I could imagine him taking the treatment of uh, Aisha Evans. And the, I could see in her stance there the deep history that frames her presence of racism, sexism, of social and economic hardship of disempowerment, of disenfranchisement, along with the powers of generations of elders and neighbors and women and people who saw her beauty and spirit and humanity. That kind of density of frame, that density of presence that would be around her, that she carried with her, what is what Wiley might deploy to make a portrait of her. And at the same time, her presence, simply standing there on a hot July day against the highway shade and thirsty grass, faced with a wall of black armor, that, that was complete as a composition in itself. Ms. Evans, in a BBC America interview, spoke about that photo and that moment that it became more than her in an instant it was carried beyond her. Uh, she was captured, found images of urban art, graffiti. One example was of the officers as robots with cube-styled heads. And Aisha in herself, radiant colors of blue and green with a blue halo surrounding her. It was beyond her as the individual and into something more transcendent and powerful of black power, women power, someone alone showing black men that their queens support them, as she said. This is all part of what happens when we let the beauty that makes us truly transform us and be able to see the entirety and the complexities of our world. And then say, now what do we do with this witness, with this information? Beauty created in community is what we do as a congregation. And explore what is possible, what we need to keep doing to sustain ourselves, to express our passion and life. We have an example of one of the ways that shows up in our community, in our immediate Peoria community. I saw this from uh, Eric Masters, a member at Imago Day Church from Big Picture Peoria. So this picture, uh, Peoria is the Hello Peoria mural, began in 2018 at the Big Picture Street Festival, where the public created an abstract mural using super soakers filled with paint. And then various artists went and finished the painting. Um, 
on. And then it evolved over the next year and a half or so with additional artists from Bradley and other places coming in to kind of fill up from the ground to the top of the building to make an entirely other statement than a blank wall, to fill up the world with beauty. And then an additional Uruguayan, Uruguayan artist, Marissa Bernardi, flew in to also add to it. So not just local, but international relations, putting everything together as a community across the globe to create something new. This is one of those examples of when what we make, all that we bring with us in terms of being willing to witness the world and coming together, then creates new beauty of its own. But I want to close with one last image of beauty, one that is the result in creation um, and continues in the life of our congregation from our families and in the church. This image is one of a heart chalked into the church parking lot. It's in multiple colors, created with tape outlines. Um, and I want to thank the Franklin family who all created this. I saw them all on the ground, all coloring in the chalk together. And there, and there in these words, is the simple message of be kind. Our great purpose in gathering is to offer more justice, more love, more compassion to ourselves, to those we know, and to those we do not know, that we may create a more beautiful and more abundant life together. Let us go forth in returning and re-exploring and re-encountering all the beauty that makes us. Let us go forward with these words and simply be kind. Let us close with our him, now let us sing. Now let us sing, sing to the sing, 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 sing. Now let us sing, sing to the sing, sing, sing. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the faith with Now let us sing, sing to the sing. Sing, sing, now let us sing, 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 lift up your voice, be not afraid, now let us sing to the power of the hope with now let us sing, 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 now let us sing, 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 lift up your voice, be not afraid, now let us sing to the power of the Sing, sing, now let us sing, 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 lift up your voice, be not afraid, now let us sing to the power of the joy within. From the Reverend Maureen Killeran, we extinguish the chalice flame daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. What to do with beauty? or joy for that matter in the midst of tragedy, of violence, of cruelty. What to do with the living? Give each other their due. Do not lose ourselves in any of it, but find ourselves anew. Where there is beauty, amplify it. Where beauty is hidden, reveal it. Where beauty is ruined, <laughs> restore it. Where beauty is absent, create it. This. This can be our gift to our bruised and aching world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin.